Hey toy family, welcome to another episode of the Marsham Toy Hour where we discuss anything and everything designer toys. I'm Gary Ham, and today with me is a creative genius. He's founded and helped create many businesses like Ello, Budnitz Bicycles, and the one that you are probably the most familiar with, Kid Robot. Let's get to know the amazing man responsible for building the company. Let's say hello to Paul Budnitz. Hey, <laughs> that was such a nice introduction. Thank you. <laughs> No, it's, it's great to finally talk with you. I think I've been in the designer toy scene since 2005 or whatnot, and our paths have never crossed at any conventions or anything, so it's great to finally uh, get to talk with you. Yeah, same here, totally. So, Paul, well, what we do on the show is, around, usually it's, it's more of a roundtable discussion of designer toys, what, what happened that week in social media and whatnot, but I think for you, I think I like to just kind of take a trip down memory lane and get to know how you started the company everything, so... We have like a wide range of listeners for the show. So we have, of course, the veterans uh, who've been around for a long time, who are familiar with you and very much, you know, familiar with Kid Robot. But we also have a lot of listeners who are just now starting collecting toys. Mm. Of course, they know of Kid Robot, but, but they probably don't know too much about the journey the company's been on, what, the past 16 years or so. So how about you take us down that memory lane a little bit? Oh, boy. Um, yeah, it was a while ago. So Kid Rob- so you'd like to know how Kid Robot started. Yeah. So I guess, well, what happened was I was shooting films for a living, kind of. And I, I was making movies. And I was making some animated movies. And I was making live action movies. And um, this was back in the late 90s. And I was, well, what would happen is these were art films. So I would go out and make like some crazy film with my friends. And then I would go broke. And then I would have to like make more money to pay for the next film. And on the side, I had kind of discovered that I also have a real problem with authority. So I was uh, pretty good at starting businesses. So I'd start these businesses kind of on the side. I had a used clothing company. We sold really high end vintage to Europe. And I had a company called Mini Disco where we hacked mini disc players and headphones and stuff like that. And about, I don't know, about 2000, 2001, um, it turns out that Jim Crawford and Greg, who owned Strange Co. and who made all those amazing Strange Co. toys, mm -hmm. uh, worked with me. Actually, they worked for me at this company, Mini Disco, and Greg showed up one day with this Michael Lau toy, and it, I was just completely blown away. At the time, like, designer toys were, they didn't really exist in the U.S. To find them, you went on, you know, you went on to websites. Um, they were barely available even on eBay. Um, they were just sort of this unheard of thing. And right. so I fell in, I was like, that's so great. And I actually took a trip to Asia and like hunted down the, you know, five or six people in the world that were actually making these toys at that time. I mean, Metacom had just started out mm -hmm. and Michael Lau was still making really like the earliest, earliest, earliest crazy children stuff. And Eric So was there and a few others in Hong Kong. And then there was Bounty Hunter in, yep. in, in Japan. And that was about it. And I just looked at this stuff and these guys were like, you know, they were like cutting off heads of GI Joes and molding their own heads and then like sewing like their own clothing. And the, the runs were so teeny weeny, you know, and the other thing, I guess the advantage about living in Asia is you're not far from the giant production centers where they make plastic toys. And so they sort of had this access to, to factories to make, you know, small runs of this stuff. And for everyone, it was really like kind of this sideline of love. I saw that stuff and said, oh, man, I want to do that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, I have, a, I have a degree in art, not business. So I was like, oh, this is so great. So I went home and I literally founded Kid Robot on the idea that like we would make our own toys and we would make them with our own odd American Western kind of bent on the whole thing. And now, it, how it, long did you, before you got into production, because yeah. at first you were mainly like an importer and reseller, kind of like Kid Robot was kind of like a shell company of Mini Disco at first, right? Yeah, I mean, well, it was. I mean, maybe for the first half year, that's true. Although from day one, it was really like, okay, we're going to bring in these toys, the toys that we can find. And we were selling them sort of in a separate section on Mini Disco. There was like this little oh, okay. side page where you could go and it just said toys. And you could just buy this kind of weird stuff, right? But from the start, actually, one of the first things we did was we, you know, I, I was friends with Tristan Eaton and Luke, who's also called Filth. And, and, you know, I was at the time, I was going back and forth between the Bay Area and New York City, and I was more or less mostly living in New York, and uh, Tristan was actually 
who ended up designing Dunny and Money with me and a bunch of other stuff. And I actually, by the way, have to bow and say that like, you know, most of the talent behind those characters really is Tristan. I mean, he's, he's just an amazing illustrator. And mm -hmm. Tristan was doing the, uh, doing the characters for an animated film I was trying to make at the time that eventually melted down and died and never actually got made. But as we became friends, I was introduced more and more to the um, street art community in New York City. Yep. And uh, so one of the first things we did was I was like, okay, I'm going to make this company and we're going to make like these really weird art toys and I'm going to use all my hoodlum sort of street artist friends. And we're going to assume that everyone will think they're famous, like awesome artists, because we all thought they were and we are, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, sure. And so we would, I would make this company and I'm, of course, I didn't have any money to start it except for um, what was left of Mini Disco. So um, I actually ended up selling Mini Disco using the proceeds to fund Kid Robot. Wow. Jim and um, Greg went off and founded Strange Co., which was e equally awesome. They really just made I know it was like this funny little thing. It was almost like a little incubator for art toys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, so so early on too, because the toys were yeah. still so foreign to America at this time. So oh man, yeah, it was it was like nuts. It was like I, I actually went out to try to raise money because you know, it, and I didn't know what I was doing at all, yeah. and I just got laughed at. I mean, it was like I would go into meetings and I would say, "Hey, yeah, I want to raise a quarter million dollars to start this company," and people would just say, so you're going to make toys <laughs> for adults and they're going to be limited edition uh -huh. and you're going to use artists that nobody's heard of. I said, yeah, <laughs> guess. <laughs> going to be gigantic, really. <laughs> yeah, sounds like a great plan. I watch a lot of Shark Tank and I know that like what they would say, probably have said to you at the time, it'd be like, you come to us too soon. We're not going to invest in you. And that's probably what you heard a lot. And so how scary was it knowing that you weren't getting the investors and this was all going to have to be funded by you at least initially and uh, so how you know what was it like going into this all on your own right yeah it was a combination of like nerve-wracking and really awesome i mean i i have to say like i have a weird i don't know what it is but i have a weird thing about myself that when i'm enthusiastic about something especially something like i'm creating or working on and my heart's in it i just believe in it you know i yeah. believe in it like so with my whole soul in a way that's completely irrational, I guess. Um, but it does kind of get you through when things are hard. And so the kid, when I started Kid Robot, I just thought I was so in love with these toys and the art. I just thought it was just inevitable. So, like, you know, for me, it was, um, yeah, it was hard. And I literally got laughed out of rooms raising, trying to raise money. And I ended up actually just putting all my own money into it. Um, which I didn't really have. So I, I mortgaged a house and went into debt, essentially. Oh, wow. And, I, and it was not a very expensive house, so it sounds quite glamorous. But um, at one point in my early, one of my really early businesses, I made a whole bunch of money all at once and had the down payment and bought a house in Berkeley and where I was living at the time. And so I mortgaged the house. And then I didn't really realize until afterwards, um, see, my parents had co-signed so I could buy this house. <laughs> oh, no. So when I had like mortgaged, when I took out, basically a loan. I got a loan from a bank and signed over the house as like collateral. What I didn't realize was like, essentially that was my parents' retirement because they had helped oh. me buy it. And, and <laughs> my parents aren't super rich people either. And so I kind of had to make the company work or else that would have been really bad for everybody. Yeah, um, totally. <laughs> yeah. So that was, that was a good motivating factor. Yeah. No, I can't even imagine knowing that my parents' financials are dependent on something that I'm trying to build, especially something so new as, as Kid Robot at the time. Like, okay, so you started with your first toys. The first one was the Cheech Wizard by Von Bodie, and then after that, you did the Kid Robot 01. God, you know, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I did, some, I did some research. And then we did Dunny. And two th yeah, and so in 2002, then you started making the Dunny with uh, Tristan Eaton. And so tell me if this is true. In the designer toy scene, there's lots of rumors and – you never know what to believe. And so I heard something from someone that was saying that originally you had approached Medicom about the Bear Brick and were trying to get uh, maybe some branding on the Bear Brick using Kid Robot or something like that, but you got turned down and then hence that's why you decided to make your own DIY platform. Is there any truth to that? No, that's not true. But what we did do, I did approach Medicom at some point about doing stuff together and even just distributing for them in the U.S. because I just thought their stuff was so amazing. Yeah, and they did turn us down. Uh, but I don't. But I would say I, I don't know if "turn us down" is the right word because we did end up doing 
a lot of stuff with them in the end. And we did end up selling a bunch of their stuff. So I, I think that as the company grew, I just think for them, like, you know, they need to be credited for a lot of the real early stuff, especially on the Japanese side. Sure. And I think like for them, they were like, you know, the Japanese are not quick to make decisions as people. And they were like, who is this like weird guy showing up in a t-shirt <laughs> from America, uh -huh. you know, and they were, so I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I guess I, there, it was, we didn't decide to do that out of that. Actually, Tristan and I sat down and said, um, why don't we make the world's greatest canvas for customizing toys? Mm -hmm. And the idea was you no know, hard edges. And this is when Dunny got made. Um, money was actually several years later. Dunny was first. Yep. And, and there were no hard edges. It was all curves. The idea was even at a small size, you could use a pen to draw on it. And the other idea was like, okay, we need to give this character some attitude. So if you actually look at the Dunny toy, one of the things that makes it rad, and unlike, I mean, actually, one of the things that makes the Bear Brick so beautiful is that it is, in fact, just so stiff. And it reminds you a lot of a Lego character, right? Yep. But when we, we wanted Dunny to be really different. So one of the things we did is if you look at the toy, it's actually really organic. One foot is in front of the other. The neck is cut at an angle, mm -hmm. and which makes the shoulders hunch and gives the little this little character a lot of attitude. And that was the thing. It was like, okay, you know, the whole thing about Kid Robot, it's the aesthetic. There's a whole bunch of sort of things that make up the Kid Robot aesthetic when I was there. I'm not going to talk about recently, but until I left in 2012, it was um, – there, there was always sort of this mixture of – something that was kind of cute and something that was a little scary, something that was kind of aggressive and something that was kind of friendly. The idea is that really, and maybe you've heard me speak about this before, but like, you know, the thing is that like when you're, when you're making toys for children, they, they tend to have sort of one thing going on, like they're cute or they're tough, yeah. uh, you know, if it's like a Joe or they're friendly or they're huggable or whatever. It's like kind of one thing. But, you know, as we grow, as we mature, hopefully as human beings, and hopefully not too much, but as we mature as human beings, we start to have mixed feelings and the mixed feelings is a mark of adulthood. And one of the things that makes kid robot toys feel like adult toys is that there's usually one or two things going on. You know, it's a guy in a bunny suit with a chainsaw and those things don't really fit together or, or something that's incredibly adorable like gloomy bear, but that's then covered with blood. Right. And so the Dunny had that same, I think, I really recognized that right at the beginning. I mean, Cheech wizard we did first because it was a street art icon um, it had been used during the 70s and 80s on subway cars in New York City, and it was sort of like putting a stake in the ground. And then the kid robot character, Dunny, you know, they're really made to be able to sort of express a lot of different emotions. And I think, you know, and the one, I think one of the reasons Dunny's been so successful is because it just really has this attitude, mm -hmm. you know, Dunny, the same thing. Yeah. Uh, one thing I always appreciate about it, which you actually sort of mentioned, is that it's not a twinned uh, platform. Like one ear is slightly taller than the other, one foot's in front of the other. It's, so you look at it and it's not, you know, a lot of people will just twin the left side to the right side yeah. and, and done. Like, and that's like one th Yeah, exactly. And uh, that's one thing I've always appreciated about the Dunning. It, it does have that slight askewness to it. And um, yeah. so the Dunning of Money essentially, it just became like the backbone of Kid Robot. And Kid Robot grew very quickly. I mean, I know a lot of collectors will credit the money, or essentially more so the Dunny, for being responsible for being their gateway into getting into designer toys. And I would essentially, it's because of that, it almost seems like Kid Robot is largely responsible for the designer toy scene that grew through, you know, the last 16 years to where it is today. And so you were wearing all hats. You were, you know, the founder, you were the president, you were the creative director, marketer. Yeah. And everything. And well, let's talk about the marketing. So marketing, what marketing? Trying to sell, <laughs> you know, yeah, trying to, well, Zero but, marketing. but, but that's the, that's the best part is trying to sell these new art collectibles. Couldn't have been easy because there wasn't really a market for it yet in the state. So how did you take something that was fairly new, like kid robot and art toys toys for adults and turn it into something that was it essentially became like a very popular lifestyle brand it was highly sought out there you had lines wrapping around your your stores and it became like a very viral thing how did you go from nothing to something so quickly well 
But I mean, the first thing was, because remember, we started out with this website that was sort of on this mini, on the backbone of this thing where we were selling mini disc players, you know, and headphones. And then, then Kid Robot had its own website. And six months later, I just knew I needed a store because the thing is like, you could look at them online, but when you see them in person, it was just this magic thing. And the other thing is presentation is kind of everything. And I, I was, had been really obsessed with retail design and with museum design. I just sort of, I don't know why, but I had just become really interested in how, and how things are presented. And so I knew to, knew I needed a store. Again, I didn't have much money, so I was walking down Haight Ashbury in San Francisco, and there was a hippie dude who was selling T-shirts almost a few doors down from the corner where the store still is, actually. And I gave him three thousand dollars for his lease. Wow! Wow! <laughs> he was going. I think he was going out of business anyway. I was like, I want your store. He was <laughs> like, Well, and I gave him three grand for the lease. And then we had this store. And so I opened the store and I was literally like just sitting behind the counter in the store and kind of running the web store on a computer at the same time, doing most everything. And this kind of, I'd been open for like two hours and this gigantic dude with a shaved head <laughs> came running in. I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, he came running. He's like, oh my God, these things are amazing. And he spent like a hundred, 200 bucks or something. I was like, wow, that's cool. And he left. And then like later in the day he came in again, <laughs> he was like, he's like, these are just so great. And, it, <laughs> and then, um, and are you looking for someone to work here? <laughs> and I hired him and it turned out it was Huck Gee, mm-hmm. uh, who, you know, as everyone knows, has turned into one of the greatest toy artists ever. Yeah. And Huck, uh, so Huck was the store manager for the first, I don't know, nine months until maybe it was long. I mean, I can't remember the timeline here, but Huck essentially ran the store at that point and helped me kick like the homeless people out of the front door when they were sleeping <laughs> there in the morning, very gently and nicely because uh-huh. we're respectful. But so we had the store in Haight-Ashbury and pretty soon after that, I went back to New York City because I thought New York's where this is going to be at. And I opened the store on Prince Street and this, the timing for that was great because Unfortunately, there had been 9-11 and retail in downtown New York, like Manhattan had been just devastated. And it was the same thing. I think I spent $15,000 to buy that store. You have to buy out leases in good locations. It's just kind of how it works, I guess. And there was a, a store going out of business. So the original Kid Robot store on Prince Street was the same thing. I, yeah, so we had these awesome locations. And I think really that did it because we didn't spend any other marketing money. It was just really just people would walk in and they'd look at the toys and they go, wow, this is like the greatest stuff. And it, it really... Or they look confused and then, you know, say abusive things and leave. So it would be one or the other. Uh But then we – and that really – I think that the retail stores grew the company and the website allowed it to become international. It was a very, like, guerrilla marketing campaign for you, right? Like you you worked with a lot of already established brands and you got in with them. You had great collaborations. How much did all that help fuel the movement of Kin Robot? Oh, yeah. Well, that helped. I mean, well, you know, the thing is that the gorilla part of it is that we were really just we we're working with our friends. Right. So all the original kid robot artists, people like Huck and Tristan and Filth and um, Tara McPherson. And, you know, you can just go down the list like these yeah. are people we were friends with. And most of them weren't known at all yet. And so it was pretty easy to get them to work with us. I'm like, I'm going to make a toy. They say, great. But the thing is, as they became well known, they're it was kind of this great symbiotic thing where, you know, their fans would go, Oh wow, look at this kid robot thing. And then of course kid robot fans would go, Oh, look at this artist. And it was part of the real mission of kid robot was okay. Every, this has kind of been true at all my companies and for better or for worse, it's like it, we're here to serve the customers, the people who work at the company, the people who make the stuff from the company. Like we're going to do everything for everyone all the way through. There's this sort of, policy that I've always held. I held it at Kid Robot. It's like if you work with this company, whether you're coming in as an artist, whether you're coming in as a friend, whether even if it doesn't work out, we will spend the rest of our lives doing everything we can to help you with your career. So it became really, a, yeah, it's awesome. And and I, when anyone does anything else, I always think it's just both mean and, but also kind of just idiotic because, you know, then what you end up with is all these people and you have a lot of mutual gratitude and you create a real community. And I think the way kid robot really grew was it was, it was a community. It was a community of artists and of fans. And so I would say that a lot of the growth just came from, well, Tara became really quite famous and Mm -hmm. people then would look back at the toys and would help the brand. Um, and the same thing happened with Huck, you know? And so everyone got to build their own following based 
with each other. And, and then of course, like things like doing, you know, like when we did our, our first real branded collab, I think if you want to call it that the first one that really counted and I had, I had refused by the way, to license anything, um, besides stuff from artists. Like, yeah, part of the other rule was, you know, uh, with the exception of things that were like Dunny and money that were built for kid robot, we don't own any of the art, right? We're just going to license it from you to make these toys. You can do whatever you want with it afterwards. And, Mm -hmm. um, but the real like gangbuster thing that really helped was when I got a call basically from Matt Groening about Simpsons. And I, that was the first time that I said, okay, I'll do a collab. I'll actually do a licensed brand thing with you because first of all, it was him personally. And he, the second of all, he wanted to do it in kid robot style. So we got to restylize Simpsons to look like kid robot characters. And I'm, and I was just, and still am just an enormous fan. I know it's like the biggest TV show ever and it's commercial and all that, but I can't help it. It's just been so rad forever. And so, um, so that was great because that brought a lot of new people to the brand and helped it grow. Too. Now that licensing, did Simpsons come before gorillas and like Yo Gabba Gabba? I feel like those were before the Simpsons. They may have been. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. Well, Gorillas was a fucking great story. Excuse me for swearing. Can I swear on your podcast? Hell yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, fuck yeah. So the thing is that um, you're right. Okay, well, Yo Gabba Gabba almost doesn't count because in a way, what had happened was Kid Robot was always going out of business. I think you mentioned this in your note to me. Yes, Kid Robot was always going out of business. Kid <laughs> Robot was like, uh-huh. the, it was like the business disaster because like essentially – Every month I'd have to make payroll and order more toys and every month I didn't have enough money and I'd have to come up with the money. And I think I, I made payroll every month, I think. There may be some stories that I didn't, but I kind of think I did. I don't think ever, anyone ever didn't get paid, but we almost did. I nearly had like a heart attack <laughs> trying to keep it running. Uh-huh. And because we were growing and it's just toys are a bitch to make. I don't know what it was doing. The gorillas to- – so this is a great story that I don't know if a lot of people have heard. but Let's hear it. So, gorillas. Yeah. So, so anyway, Yo Gabba, first I'll tell you the goat, Yo Gabba Gabba, and then I'll tell you the great story. So, Yo Gabba Gabba was, then suddenly we were set free because Charlie Rivkin, who was, had the biggest heart in the world and was the former, he used to run the Jim Henson company and all the Muppet stuff. He, I came to him for advice and then like, he became the CEO of, uh, Wild Brain Entertainment, which was a digital animation company, Mm -hmm. um, and they invested in Kid Robot with the idea that we would get to make cartoons and stuff too. And I was like, this is rad. I want to do animation. I'd already done some animation, so it was right up my alley. And when they joined, one day he came to me and he said, hey, we got this, someone wrote us a proposal of this like crazy TV show and he showed me the Yo Gabba Gabba stuff and I was like, this is brilliant. We need to do it. So I was helping out on the back end of Wild Brain getting Yo Gabba Gabba going and then... So to me, that Yo Gabba Gabba felt less like licensing and more of like these amazing guys who are just like they had invented these amazing characters and, yeah. you know, it was just brilliant. And so and the same thing, really, like Gorillas came to us and it was like Jamie and it's like, holy shit, like, again, another hero, right? Have to work with this person. And so the so here's the funny story about the um, I don't know if it's funny, but here's the story about <laughs> uh, I'm not going to name names here, but the Gorillas toys. So what happened was. Gorillaz came to us and said, we'd love to make toys with you. And I was like, hell yes, we'll do it. First Gorillaz album came out, had come out. So I, at the time we were making, we had an agent who was helping us get our toys made in China. And the way it works when you don't know what the hell you're doing is you send some money to the agent and you say, please make, well, you, what you say is here's a toy. And then the, you know, the first you have to do the you have to sculpt it and then you have to, from the sculpts, you have to do coloring models and then you eventually get like demo versions. And then from the samples, you actually make production. The, all, at every stage you have to put in a little bit of money, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. And so we would send a money to the agent and then eventually like very late we get a sample. And after a while, and this had been only gone on for a year, there was this gigantic gap of months and then six months between getting the stuff back that we should have got, right? And things were just stalling out. I didn't know what the hell was going on and I was getting fairly pissed off when a Chinese friend of mine uh, who was also in the toy doing like some toy stuff, one of the Chinese artists came to me and said, Paul, why aren't you paying your factories for your toys? I said, what are you talking about, man? I've just sent like I'm broke. I've sent everything I have to the factories. They haven't delivered. He said, no, they're waiting for your payment. <laughs> so I flew to China, got 
Kim from 3.0, he volunteered as a translator to help me out. We went and sort of confronted this agent of mine, and it turned out that he'd lost all the money in gambling. Oh, and no. And never given it to the factory. And held at the factories were all the Gorillas toys, and I believe it was Dunny Series 1, or was it Dunny Series 2? Anyway, it was fucked up. It was like... It was like basically all our money was sitting and the factories had gotten no money and the money was gone. Wow. So we went and, um, yeah, I was like having a heart attack. So oh, sure. we went, cause like, you know, I don't know if I'm built for this kind of thing, but I could do it. <laughs> so we went around every factory, made a deal with them, got the toys, told them we'd pay them after, eventually got them on the ship. My agent demanded $10,000 more. He had these papers I needed to get the toys on ship. So in the middle of the night, I had $10,000 in cash. Wow. I handed it to the agent in pieces, and he would like reluctantly pull back this pink piece of paper I needed to release the toys onto the ship. And finally, I got the piece of paper. He took the $10,000 and took off, right? <laughs> okay. Again, I'm not going to name his name, but what happened was that ship got on the water, and we're like waiting. It takes 30 days, right? We're waiting for our stuff to come so we can like rescue the, our awesome company. And suddenly at my front door, four agents from the Department of Homeland Security show up at my front door and they say someone has called in a dirty bomb threat, says that there's a dirty bomb inside the freight container that contains your toys. And wow. I was like, what? And they said, yeah, but we already did a background tech check on you and you're a weird guy, but we don't think you did it. I was like, well, thank you. I didn't do it. <laughs> you're a weird guy. That's, that's, that's yeah. Nice. <laughs> so you said definitely one of them said something like, you're, you're well known for being sort of eccentric or something. And I said, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, they destroyed about a quarter of the toys or half the toys in the container trying to find if there was a bomb in there, which there wasn't. Oh, man. We got the rest of the toys finally and sold them off, paid off a lot of our debt. And that agent got arrested and it took like five or six years and ended up going to jail for like – he had shut down the entire port of Oakland. Holy crap. Oh, right? It was really bad because he – it turns out he had called in. He was so mad. I don't know why he could have been mad because he got called out for being a loser. <laughs> no. Anyway, so that's that's that's, that's an one of many stories about how we barely survived. That's an incredible story. I mean that, that would cripple most people. Um, yeah. But somehow you made it through it. That's like a, that's a Hollywood story right there. Yes, so yeah, I didn't think about that. <laughs> that's a good idea, though. I mean, I guess it was pretty fortunate, you know, that it was Gorillas Toys. It already had a fan base built into it. So I imagine, you know, if it wasn't something completely unknown and and risky, it's you know, the, I would assume that the Gorillas Toys sold really well and pretty quickly. For yeah, them. they did. Although you know, when you lose about half your stock, it and you're and you just have to pay back factories for money you'd already paid them before. I mean, the whole thing was just one. It was just one. Yeah. Thing. I mean, but you know, like having run businesses as a way to survive my entire life, I, I'm not complaining. It's just sort of always. It's kind of always like that. There's yeah. always something. And yeah, I don't hear you complaining at all. I, I just hear you saying that when you're new at something, especially like toys and mass production and dealing with factories, that there's going to be mishaps along the way. And you definitely ran into some, you know, life yeah, lessons. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we learned a lot, I'll tell you. <laughs> you learn what you're good at and what you're not good at, too. Yeah. Well, to that point, like I mentioned earlier, how many hats you were wearing at Ken Rob. You were president and um, CEO and marketing and designer and creative director. Like you, you did dabbled in all areas and aspects of the company. And at some point, right. um, I heard that you did realize that you just couldn't do everything. Um, and you decided to step down as president and focus mainly on being the creative director and, you know, marketing and that sort of just creative side of the company. Um, that's true, right? That's correct. Yeah. It, I mean, you know, the thing is like, it's important to know what you're good at. And I'm actually fairly good at the early stages of being an entrepreneur, like, you know, the real gorilla stage where you're spending money and you're inventing things. You have no idea if it'll work. But once things start kind of running and they're just, just chugging along, like you just really don't want me as because I, in a way, like I'm just so interested in what's next. I, I always try to find someone um, the same thing is actually true for Budnitz Bicycles, my bicycle company, and for Ello. I mean, I actually bowed out of both those companies. I was CEO of both companies and bowed out mm -hmm. and said, you know, Jeremy's running the bike company is like way better at it than me. So he runs it, and I continue to help with the creative. And, and, and actually, we have Hunt here, who's a way better bicycle engineer than I am. So part of it is like I can hold a really 
strong vision, but I really rely on people that have really deep skills to make the rest of the stuff happen. And that's smart. Like, um, you sound like a project jumper. Yeah, I, that sounds like a, oh man, I would be a bad way to say it, I think. But I would, the way I'd put it, I don't think I'm a project jumper and the reason is that I stick around. That is, yeah. I know what I'm good at. And when someone invests in one of my companies, literally like the bicycle company, we have some, we're here in Vermont now and we have local investors who put money in. I sit down with them and Woo, which is my new messaging app, like I built this messaging app because I was fucking fed up with all the ads and manipulation on everything else. I built a messaging app for, so you basically use them my friends and now it's public, um, like everything. But it was just, it's like I sit down with them. I said, well, I always sit down and say, well, if you want to put money in my company, I would love to have you. And one of the things about me is that when I think I'm no longer useful, we're going to hire someone else to do my job. And actually for professional investors, I can't tell you the number of companies I've seen or heard of. Um, and these guys have the same experience where the founder won't get out of the way, you know? Yeah. And like, mm -hmm. I'm all about getting out of the way, man. Like, as I think I've shown, like I, I left kid robot was when it was still pretty much at the top, mainly because I just felt like I was going to start repeating myself. I didn't think, I wanted to do the same stuff over and over. I thought it would end up hurting the company. And so I thought it was time for me to go and do some other stuff. So I did. Yeah. And there were, there were other factors playing into it as well. But I, that was that was a very deep piece of it. And the same is really true for the bike company. And, you know, Elo, I, I was CEO until a year ago and left and just called the investors and said, you know, I will just keep fucking with things <laughs> yeah. and, and not making money. And so we need someone around who will let me fuck with things and then sometimes sit me down and go, you know, we actually have to release this bicycle now. I'm like, all right, well, let's work it out. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, you know, tinkering, that's, that's kind of what artists, you know, kind of get locked into sometimes. And, but that's good that you're not stubborn and hardheaded in the fact that you, you knew when to stop or when to listen to others. And, um, like I heard that kid robot had like a, you very much welcomed input and suggestions and there's a creative, um, kind of like brain trust going on there and um you also have the kid robot forums and yeah in the end you know maybe you you know did stick with your final idea and it just ran with what you originally thought but you were willing to accept the suggestions of others well, and I stuff had, you know so. phillips just a genius oh who was that like you know chad phillips who was sort of my right hand oh yeah he, he used to call himself paul's second opinion <laughs> but Chad's job mainly, I mean, he was, he had all these different roles at the company at different times, but Chad's job mainly was just to sit around and have, and be smart and have, and be creative. Mm -hmm. Like that, that is true. Like it, you know, when I was early on starting out, no one had, I didn't study business. So I just kind of came up with this idea that it was my job to make great toys at Kid Robot. It was not my job to do it myself if I could find someone better to do it. And so it was, you know, it, at some point I had this revelation that if I got myself completely out of the way, we'd just make great stuff. So sometimes, I mean, you know, I, I'll say a lot of the Dunny sets, for example, the artists that were in it, choosing which ones were in it, sorting them out, even a lot of those Dunny designs by some of the artists were actually designed by me or in-house. Like we'd find an artist, we'd say, hey, this would be great. Uh, we designed a dunny for you. Is this okay? <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. That's cool. <laughs> but but I, and I, that was a minority. I mean, I think the really a lot of them, we'd give them the dunny, and then they then we'd go back and forth 15 times until we found something that we thought was actually going to – people would like. Because sometimes mm -hmm. you go to an artist, and they just put a circle in the front, you know, and you're like, mm, yeah, but yeah. that's not so great, um, unless it's a really great circle. But And, and the thing <laughs> is – but I, I just figured, like, if I could get out of the way, then I could like the whole world was my resource. And one of the really big things I did at Kid Robot literally was to say, okay, everyone has a voice and we developed sort of creative systems. So everyone did have a voice. And if you didn't speak up and help out, you probably weren't going to last at the company. I mean, we'd be pretty brutal about letting people go. Mm -hmm. I mean, and a lot of people that started out like as interns or just, they ended up like, you know, like Joanna Seager, Seagard who ran the whole art department was a, she came in as my assistant originally, you know, she ended up like became really, she like directed the entire art department. She managed the entire art department, every toy, you know, she was just brilliant. And so wow. that was part of it. And I think that that sense of openness, it definitely played into the company too, because it's like, yeah, we'll work with you if you make great toys, not just if you're famous, not if you're well known, like we, I mean, everyone's favorite, I think not every, I think the company favorite toy of all time was made by an artist that at that point was unknown. I don't know if he still is, and I can't remember his name. He may be famous for now, but who made this toy called Drunk Frog in Bear Suit? 
And okay. drunk, drunk Frog in Bear Suit was a frog who was drunk in a bear suit. And it was a six or eight inch tall vinyl toy that was completely not articulated. It just like kind of sat there. And it like, I think it was like famously at first, our worst toy, worst seller ever. Like it was the worst selling toy besides we once made a candle. That was the worst selling. <laughs> but that was the yeah. second worst selling toy of all time for a while just because we all liked it. And then at one point, somehow it got picked up and then it all sold out <laughs> and then it became very rare and collectible. So wow. figure, but it was always something like that. We just find things we loved and we didn't really care. We were going to do our own thing. And if you don't like it, well go fuck yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and maintaining that sense of like, I, I'd have to say there was this other thing that was going on in the toy movement at the time, the early toy movement were these ultra hipster people. They'd be like, you know, and the early, some of the early collectors were like very exclusive and hush hush and very cool and like the whole thing. And, you know, it'd be sort of like when you walked into the sneaker stores on the Lower East Side and the guy looks up from whatever magazine he's reading or nowadays from his iPhone and he just is like, fuck you, what are you doing in my store? You're definitely mm -hmm. not going to the shop here. And Kid Robot was not that. My thing was like, everybody's welcome. Everybody can come in as long as you're not an asshole. If you're an asshole, we're going to kick you out of our out of our store. We were like also famous for kicking assholes out of the store. So if you're a jerk, we just say get the fuck out of here. We're not selling to you, and people would be completely surprised. And I would back that up forever. You know? Wow. Yeah. 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 And That'd your stores cool. like had the, the you know the toys display, display behind glass. It was really clean. So you kind yeah. of mentioned it's kind of like a museum like setting to where it would yeah, because it was behind glass would it elevate like in a like someone off the street would it elevate what is essentially a toy to be an art piece to the you know off the street person yeah yeah right yeah you recognize that well i, I mean the thing is that the um if you see a pile of toys in a traditional comic book store you know it's just sort of like it's just a bunch of junk behind plastic hanging on a uh, you know hanging in blister packs on the wall and it right. but if you take that same toy and you put it inside a glass vitrine and put a spotlight on it it's suddenly you know and if it's and you know and if it's worthy of that that's the other half you can't take a piece of junk and stick it on well you can i suppose and stick it on a vitrine to look a little bit better but but if you've made something really ex ex spectacular you know and i think a lot of the toys we made were sort of i don't think there's anything we made that truly sucked they really didn't that was sort of our mantra does it suck we won't make it and so if there's a spot there was like a spotlight on it and you look at it, you can notice, oh, my God, that is just so beautiful. And it really allowed the piece to sit out and, and to say to the world, okay, this is art. And it's a toy. And it's art. And it's a toy. But it really you could say this is art. And I think that that presentation definitely helped a lot. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty funny how the design of toy scene is. Like, you know, someone might make a you know, a vinyl piece of poop, you know, make it right. purple or pink and, you know, it can sit behind a piece of glass and, yeah, super you know, it's, it's, yeah, super do. Yeah. It's, it's more than just a piece of poop all of a sudden, but yeah. you know, <laughs> <laughs> so like, so we were talking about how kid robot grew so fast. And yeah. I think it's really cool that you took, you know, essentially unknown artists at the time, like Hachi and other artists. And by being a kid robot artist, that added a lot of clout to a lot of people and you would see their names on the website and, to collectors and stuff, it made them more established, I guess, in the in this toy scene to be a labeled a kid robot artist and hmm. yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I mean, I've known a few collectors that sort of like you know took took a little more notice when someone was um, in a Dunny series. You know, um, I've also known a lot of artists whose you know hopes hmm. were writing on one day getting into a Dunny series or getting something produced through Kid Robot. So, I mean, I think that's. A lot of it's based on the brand that you had built, you know, how popular it was. And, uh, you know, from the outside in, it looks like you're really helping careers and, and stuff like that. And f so I think for a lot of people, being a kid robot artist felt more like a, a reaffirmation of your place in the designer toy scene or uh, finally getting acknowledged and credit for the artwork that you're doing or something like that? Isn't that a terrible thing about America? I hate that about America personally. It's just, I mean, some things, I, I think in a way, okay, with Kid Robot, some of it you could say it was earned because like I said, I'm proud of everything I was involved with, I'm deeply proud of. And I think that the people we worked with, I can clearly state, I mean, I can't think of anybody that we worked with that I am not excited about their work. Mm -hmm. and what they did so yeah so maybe in a way that that sense because we were curating you know just like an art gallery we were looking at what people were doing and we were saying this person is amazing we're going to 
do everything we can, you know, yeah. to help them. And let's, let's just do that. I, I don't know. That was the community aspect of it. So I can see how that could have happened. Yes. And generally in America, I just, I, I just like how certain people and brands get disproportional power to name who is, isn't, isn't a good artist. I, I find that often frustrating and disturbing but but it's not just in america though is it like you know in other like asian countries you know yeah. having face is really important whether you're a doctor sure. or something else like a lot of these positions of stature and stuff become so much grander than what's really important so like yeah you're, you're producing toys on your own but you haven't worked with kid robot yet but why yeah why would it be because now you're working with kid robot why does that establish you more so than you selling out 500 toys on your own. It's, it's a strange thing, but it's, I agree. You know, um, I so am. you grew the company pretty fast. And at some yeah. point I read that you were estimated to making 60 products a year, which is, that's a phenomenal amount of toys. Yeah. One a week, essentially. That's crazy. We never release every week. Yeah. And so I mentioned, I'm an avid watcher of shark tank and I know that <laughs> amount of quantity requires a significant amount of capital. So surely at some point, in the beginning, you couldn't get uh, investors. No. It's, at any point, when you start becoming more popular, we did. The lifestyle we, brand, that's you when got we got s- Wild Brain to come in, and they really saved and they really saved us. So they gave okay. us enough money to cover production and um, cover payroll and build out the stores and, and stuff like that. And but they were, you know, and I think that was probably three or four years into the business. So we, mm-hmm. you know, I managed to open the New York store on my own and the San Francisco store, and uh, I think the first Genesis of LA, actually, um, when it was on Melrose, uh, not on Melrose, on, um, down by the water, on the promenade in okay. Santa Monica. But the, you know, and then, then I made a gigantic blender. Actually, I think this was, if you ask me what the biggest mistake was I made at Kid Robot, it was we had the most awesome little store on Prince Street, um, and the problem with the store on Prince Street was it was 320 square feet, and there was a line always around the corner, halfway up the block, to get into gotcha. the store. So we could only let six people in at a time because that's how big it was. And I just had all the, we were just making so much stuff. We couldn't even put in, we couldn't fit in the store. And and we were bringing in stuff from artists like you that were making their own stuff and overseas. You know, we would carry toys also from other people. So we were just out of room. And I was like, man, and the store up the street, you know, was three doors up the street, four times as four or five times as big on two floors. And I said, oh, it'd be so great. We'd have all this room. So we switched. We actually traded stores with them because they were downsizing. And we mm-hmm. took over the big store and moved over. And I spent a bunch of money redoing that store. It really was beautiful, the second kid robot store. And the problem was, and I didn't really realize it, was first of all, I think it just lost the magic. Yeah, because it was too big. I, I, it lost the smallness. And that was, a, and it wasn't even a big, uh, you know, as stores go, it was still what you consider a small store. I mean, you know, you go into like a old Navy and it's 12,000 square feet or something. And this was a, you know, it was still like a 1600 square foot store, but it just felt bigger and it felt less intimate. It just, it, to me, that was a mistake. And if I could go back, the one thing I would change is I would sacrifice all the extra sales we got from the big store for just the magic of having this little tiny jewel. And, mm-hmm. and you know, um, L.A., on when it was on Melrose, was still a jewel, and the San Francisco store was still a jewel, and the London store was quite nice and small. But that big store, what I would call a big store for these small objects, essentially, yeah. just always bummed me out that we had made that switch. And, and so it was my. You probably didn't have like the lines forming outside because most people can fit inside. And there's exactly. something about driving by something and seeing the lines. Yeah. Like, oh my God, what's going on? I used to say, you know, when you have to hunt for something, you know, when you have to invest in something, right? Like, that is like, if you spend a lot of money, like, here's the thing. So, like, let's say you go and you. You want a Louis Vuitton handbag, okay? Now I'm not gonna I'm not gonna talk about whether or not you think Louis Vuitton handbag is worth owning, but you might go buy a Louis Vuitton handbag, and you can buy an official, real Louis Vuitton handbag for four to eight thousand dollars, right? You can buy a really high end one and you spend like six grand, and you get this beautiful. I mean, the craftsmanship is awesome. Um, and then you can go to Chinatown, and you can buy a handbag that you cannot tell the difference for twelve dollars and eighty six cents or something. You know what I mean? For like fifteen mm-hmm. bucks, twenty bucks. 30 bucks, you can get a knockoff that looks almost exactly the same, right? Yep. And the thing is, though, 
is that there is, I believe, an objective, not subjective, an objective difference between things that you have made a sacrifice to own. And the sacrifice can be having spent a lot of money, which is, I think, kind of not the most glamorous one. The other one can be you waited in line for it, or you got up early for it, or you traded for it, or you've been searching for it forever on eBay, and it took and you were doing that thing that yeah. we all do when we go on eBay, and then you start looking at Japanese Yahoo sites, and then you go nuts, and then and then finally you finally find like that thing that and you put like hours into it there is an objective value that you invested in yourself in it and you feel it in the object and i think that for me asking people to wait in line to buy something was not like you know about creating hype it was about creating value it was about asking us to in a world where we have the internet now we can get everything you know for nothing asking mm -hmm. us to really go out there and put our you know put yourself online to do it so there you go yeah you're 100% right on that i'm a collector myself and you know before i got into designer toys it was all about spawn toys and i would drive to every toys r us in town i don't know how many hours and gas mileage i would spend looking for that toy and that was part of the fun to trying to find these limited things you know, sometimes the figure I was looking for, only one would come per case and you'd have to find out the hours, you know, when the they restocked and all that stuff. So it's, that's kind of how Designer Toys is as well. It's like you might have to wait in line for two to four hours, but there's a story and an experience uh, built up to how you procured that. And, yeah. you know, then you had the flipper side of it where you can't obtain the toys through normal measures and then flipping became – uh, a whole side business in designer yeah, toys. Yeah, that was how like it's like ticket scalpers in a way. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we um, and we tr we tried to like kind of chill that out as much as we could, but you know, there's only so much you can do. And there's only so much you can do. Their and, job. So. Yeah, and in, in our previous episode, we had a flipper on, and we talked about you know sort of the importance and the role that they you know the flippers do play in the collectability well, market. And honestly, you know, they're willing to spend the time and energy to wait in line for other people that aren't. So I suppose exactly. it's, it's a fair relationship. We always just, you know, honestly, we always just thought of it as like free marketing. You know, if yeah. the guys, if people are running, are willing to go and do all this stuff and then they put it up on eBay and everything, it's just helping our brand in the long run and helping the artist whose name is on it create value you know oh my god you know your toy which was sold for 60 bucks is going for 600 dollars, and now <laughs> now huck's famous you know it's like yeah. good because we love huck so that's all good for everyone that is the toughest thing for i think most collectors to explain to their spouses why this three four inch toys is 60 dollars or 100 dollars. eventually they get it even for me it's like i always describe yeah. you know being a collector and designer toys it's kind of like learning to swim you'll huh. step onto the step you're wearing your floaties, okay. you know. You start with the twenty dollar toy. You start with right. the uh, the mini blind boxes. The next right. thing you know, you're buying eighty hundred dollar toys that you know are imported from Japan. And next thing you know, you got this. You spend thousands of dollars. And Dude, you know, just, I don't want to get into it. Like I'm now, right now, I'm totally obsessed again for like this must be the fifth time in my life I've gone through a phase. I'm just obsessed with Japanese indigo clothing. I'm oh, just wow. completely become enamored by the mills that are making the super high and beautiful. So anyway, I've started, so I'm doing the same thing. I mean, actually I have a shipment coming today with a couple <laughs> indigo shirts and I'm kind of sitting on the edge of my couch going like, Oh my God, I can't wait for this to come, which is kind of ridiculous. My wife's like, really Paul, it's blue. <laughs> you know, like, no man, you can wash it a hundred times and it just gets better. You know, <laughs> it's like recycling. She's like, yeah, but you shipped it from Japan. I'm like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so funny what's important to us and what others just don't get. We're all different. We are. But speaking of different and important, we have some sponsors we should probably uh, briefly mention. We have printsonwood.com. So if you're a photographer or an artist and you've ever just wanted to have your work printed on beautiful, sustainable wood, head on over to printsonwood.com. They have a wide variety of services. They can laser cut the wood in different shapes for you. They've worked with a large variety of artists already, helping them print their limited edition fine art prints on wood, and they can do the same for you. Check them out, printsonwood.com. And for all your designer toy needs, we have 3dretro.com. They also have a beautiful brick and mortar location out there in Southern California. Uh, check it out. And there's also strangecattoys.com. Uh, they'll take care of all your designer toy needs. And at checkout, be sure to use promo code MARSHAMP to receive 10% off your order. All right, let's get back to Paul Bundance. So, Paul, it was funny that you mentioned that Kid Rowan always seemed like the doors were closing. Every month you're scraping yeah. by to make, you know, 
payroll and everything. But to the outsider, Kid Robot seemed like it was on top of the world. And you grew the company from two employees to 90 employees. And I think I read a report that, you know, initially it started out with $300,000 in annual sales and it grew to a $15 million annual sales company. And 28 million. 28 million. Wow. Okay. However, around 2007, I guess 2009, things really started to change. You um, reported that that was like the first down year for Kid Robot, but you know that was also the big downturn in the economy. We really got hit in 2009, and um, yeah. so you decided to move the company to Denver, and uh, I think that was a big shock to the collector yeah. base because Kid Robot was so deeply rooted in New York. You know, you had the street cred, you had all of your amazing staff there, so. How did it affect the company, you know, the decision to move to Denver? You know, how did that affect the morale with the employees and the credibility of the company and all that stuff? Oh, it was a big mess. Um, it was, you know, I had at that point, um, I was kind of suffering from a bit of burnout. I mean, you kind of, as you said, all these things I was doing at once. And I, my daughter was, had just been born. And, um, and I love New York. Um, quite frankly, I don't love Boulder, but at the time it seemed, you know, I actually, we actually moved to Montana first just to get out of the city. We made a temporary move to Montana. I didn't um, know that. yeah, it was, I had a bunch of friends who'd like essentially started a religious community there and they were just the people I, I grew up in Berkeley. So all kinds of weird stuff happens in Berkeley. So I, I moved out there just to be near a bunch of friends. It was a temporary thing really. Um, we moved to Bozeman. And then um, tried to figure out what to do next. And our daughter was actually born there. We talked about going back to New York. And Kid Robot was still in New York. And I was sort of going back and forth um, and trying to give myself a bit of a break. And then um, we said, let's try it Boulder. We went down to Boulder. And the investors of the company and I kind of got together. And kind of the, the company was suffering a bit, I think, from honestly, from lack of me being there. Um, and being there full time and feeling like a bit, I said, well, you can move the company to me, but I'm not willing to go back to New York right now. I've just had a baby and I just can't, I can't deal with it. And so I mean, I'd been there for 18 years, most, most of the time. I mean, I'd been in San Francisco some of the time, but I'd been on and off in New York for like 18 years and, um, and we're moving over here. And so they said, okay, well, let's try it. You know, it'll, it, it's got a lower overhead. Let's see what happened. And, so, um, a lot of people, it was in some ways, I think we had to downsize the staff anyway. And it was a nice, I mean, I would say some, for the most part, actually, and not completely, but when it was probably one of the better downsizing staff, you know, when you get to, when the company grows and it's not making any excuses when you have any company and it grows at some point, you kind of look around and you go, wow, we've got all these people and the business has changed and. And, uh, and like, like you said, you know, I think the economy, we had really taken a hit and it was, you know, all these businesses were folding around us and we were holding on and we said, mm. so, um, and there was no more money, by the way, you know, if it had been 2007, we could have just gone out and raised more money in the blink. But in 2009, there was no money to be had from anybody, Right. you know, it was all every business, especially retail was hanging on by their fingernails. So everyone, half the country felt like it was out of work. So we, um. So, you know, it, we, some of the staff came to Boulder for a while and, uh, we put it together there and, and it was going okay, you know, but I, I kind of would have to agree. I actually think that the move was a mistake because it really felt like we lost some of the vibe from our core there. And, and I felt like I, and I have to just admit, like I'd lost some of my vibe then. I mean, I was just sort of. I was burnt and um, it was sort of, I feel like it would have been the time that if we had been a band, we made our bad album and we didn't actually make any bad toys at the time. But I think that what really happened was that kind of kept evolving to the point where I was like, you know, this really isn't working for me anymore. I want to go do something else. I don't feel like I have that much more to contribute here right now. And that's when I sort of started my exit from Kid Robot myself. And so then I left the company. Yeah. Um, I can't promise and say that that was like glamorous or that there were great choices. I can say still that a lot of the toys were still great. But internally, I think for me, 
losing some of the really great people um, and the magic that we had really did hurt in the end for me, the vibe of the company and led to me wanting to go, you know, cause I essentially, and, and actually at that time we actually moved out here to Vermont, um, because it allowed me to do what I do now. And so I spent a great deal of my time back in New York city, but I can still keep my family out here where it's a little more peaceful. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's great. And that's important to take care of family first yeah. and, and everything. And, but, but, you know, the move, I, I don't know how much environment would have effect on a company, but I think of Colorado and I've never been to Colorado, but I think of Colorado, yeah. I think it, you just, it's a place you want to be outdoors and you want to go hiking. And I know there's a lot of outdoors companies, you know, out there for that reason, but you know, New York is so inspired and art based and everything. I have to say, you know, when it wasn't quite as stark as it maybe we're making it sound, you know, what would the internet and everything and everyone yeah. we knew, we were still fairly connected. It wasn't that, but I actually think there's just a, I mean, New York's just a magic place, you know, and, and people, what I think I missed was, and I didn't real I didn't have the experience to know this is I missed just the amount of people that would just drop by when we were in New York, you know, someone would just drop by, Hey, yeah, my yeah. friend's here. Come on over, you know, Meet James from LCD Sound System. I'm like, oh, dude, <laughs> you know, it's like, wow, yeah, that was yeah. awesome. And that just, when you're in Boulder, that just didn't happen anymore. And you're right. I mean, it was a healthier environment. And for me, being not always a consistently psychologically healthy ind- individual, I think it was actually pretty good for me to get out. But I'm not sure it served Kid Robot in the end. So there you go. Well, Kid Robot's Thanks. still there and they're still doing good. And it, it sounds like it, it did yeah. a great deal for you and your family. And you know, you were all in since what two thousand two. You know, all in financially, creatively, putting in long hours. I mean, you did a lot of work in ten years. And, yeah, um, and I re- and I really have to say, two thousand really. I mean, we founded the company in two thousand and two, but remember, like, we were selling the toys since about two thousand when we when I started those trips and we started to bring the stuff back from Asia and just mm-hmm. you know it wasn't called Kid Robot yet, but there it was. So. Yeah, I was I was fried, and then about 2012, I just said, you know, I got to do something else because, yeah. you know, so I stepped down. Um, literally, I sold the entire company uh, except for a very small piece and um, and a few other things, and and that was painful. Um, and but you know, on the side, I'd started this bicycle company, which is still running, sitting right next to me here, and and some other. Stuff. I guess the bikes are absolutely beautiful. Paul. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I caught myself staring at them a few times. And, uh, man, if I had the, the money. The same fetishism, isn't it? It's just a different object. Yeah, it, <laughs> no, yeah, it is. It's like, um, it is a different object. But the way you approach the business, Abundance Bicycles, is sort of how yeah. you did Kid Robot and the fact that your toys you know, were displayed behind display cases and, and the bicycles are you know, displayed in high-end shops all over the world and – they're like centerpieces of these stores. They're not, you know, lined up with 40 other piece, you know, bicycles lined up on wire rack somewhere, you know? Yeah, they're in design museums. I mean, yeah, it's the same thing, so. But the Dunny and Money, they're also in, in the museum. They're in the they're MoMA, MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art. Like, yeah. How did it feel when those were put into the museum? Dude, that was great. Because you got to understand, like, I went to art school. I studied art, and some of my contemporaries went into fine arts, and it was awesome. I was like, ha-ha. <laughs> You made fun of me that I got into MoMA. Take that. <laughs> it wasn't really so much like that. It wasn't really so much like that, really. But it was just sort of, it felt great. I was like, oh, this is right. But the really thing, the best thing that happens to you when you get into into the Museum of Modern Art is you get a lifetime membership oh, for wow. free. And that is just rad. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty nice little me. perk. <laughs> you get to go, go sit in the museum for nothing, which is always a big advantage. So oh, Yeah, totally. Yeah. So I mean, so that's exciting that you guys get into the and MoMA, and then you guys, I mean, the, ah, some toys start hitting the au- auction houses and, and selling for thousands, twenty five thousand dollars, and and some of these things were you know being auctioned for, and so that's yeah. Um, so and I don't have any. Do you know that? You don't have any any toys. I whatsoever? have a small box of toys. Wow. When I left Kid Robot for various reasons. I said I got to start over, and. Um, you know, like, um, you know, you maybe you've heard this story too, but like about 2004, when Kid Robot was going and I had that kind of breakthrough that I didn't have to do everything myself. I said, you know, I got to start over. I put everything I owned on the street, everything. And I lived in an apartment in Manhattan with um, a, a little tiny, 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 tiny studio, basically. And I, I had nothing in the apartment but a chair 
Um, I didn't even have a no, I had a table and then I got the chairs later. I had a table. The only thing I kept was a table and um, some sneakers and my clothing and some cook stuff. And I didn't, I put everything I owned, including all memorabilia, like pictures from my childhood, just put on the street. Wow. And I had a big sneaker collection. It was funny because you'd see all the guys in the West Village, all the like homeless guys walking around with these. I have giant feet. <laughs> these guys walking around with, like size 13, like, you know, like total like hyper strike Nikes. It was hilarious. So, uh, but yeah, so that was so. And I, I kind of felt like I needed I've done this periodically. Uh, in fact, I've done something similar lately. And so I I and the same thing happened. I was like, you know, something's I just got to get. So when we moved from Boulder to uh, from New York City to Boulder, I took my entire toy collection, which was thousands of, I don't know, lots of toys, very, very rare, everything you name, including demos and things that no one had ever seen. And to everyone that essentially didn't stay at the company or a few people we actually had to lay out, I just gave them armloads of toys and said, here, wow. thank you, take them. And so by the end, I didn't have anything left. <laughs> it's kind so, of great, though. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting yeah, story that... It's kind of heartbreaking at this point, though. <laughs> yeah, you're sort of breaking <laughs> my heart here in the story. I can't start now again. So I, I, I have, you know, my books, so I know what they looked like. <laughs> but it's funny. Are you, it's kind of funny because you ran a company based on collectors who are essentially maximal to some degree, but you yourself just decided I'm going minimalist. I'm just going to have a chair in my house and that's it. And that's, well, uh, that's kind of I'm a great a, story. I'm not a collector. I mean, I just have to admit it. Like I'm, I'm, and this is old news about me. Sometimes I guess I occasionally early on, it was sort of contentious news about me that I'm not actually a collector. I'm a creator. Like I like to make stuff. So my thing is I want to make something. And then when I'm done making with it, like I'm done so yep. you can have it. And I want to make something else. Like that's my drive. And so if I, I, I have found that if I hold on when I was younger, especially if I hold on to things, I get stuck. And I think that's one of the reasons why people say like, Oh, you went from movies to kid robot to, bicycles to running to creating a social network with millions of people on it for artists to now a messaging app to you know the kind of clothing brand thing I'm thinking about now and it's like how do you move from one thing to the other and I think the answer is I don't actually have any baggage I'm not stuck yeah and there's good and bad about that because I'm there's heartbreak because I a lot of times I'm kind of heartbroken because I see something we made in a store window or someone emails me I'm like oh man I wish I had that oh yeah <laughs> I don't have that sucks <laughs> yeah I, I mean i know that can one day happen so that's generally why i keep one or or two pieces when i make something oh that's good yeah but but because of all these businesses you, you've helped start up and found that's that's one reason i i, I mentioned the, the term project jumper and i didn't mean that in a bad way it's the fact that but yeah you're right you know generally project jumping means that you're not completing things and you just got all these project got all these unfinished projects around and you know you've definitely seen things through into the end and you've you've you know, know when to maybe step back a little bit. and uh, But it's crazy to think about how much stuff you've done. And most people would be happy with having one great idea, but you've had many and you've pursued many. And there's been a bunch that we haven't even mentioned too. Yeah, yeah. I've had different things. That's true. I, it's a, I don't know, man. It's, to me, it's just like a form of play, you know? It's like when I was a kid, I wanted everyone to come together and we would just like all of us would get together and play and make stuff. Mm -hmm. And my, uh, interestingly, my daughter, who's now eight and a half, is identical, has inherited this from me. So I come home, she's like, Papa, mm -hmm. I've made a museum exhibition today, you know? I'm like, oh my God. And then, like, after she's done with that, she's on to the next project. And it's just so familiar. And so to me, businesses are, I mean, you know, we're adults, so it's never just play. But in a way, it is, it's like, my bike company is, I love everyone who works here. It's like, oh, we get to make like the world's greatest bicycles mm -hmm. together. And, and the fact is, like, if I just had wanted to become ridiculously wealthy, we could have sold Kid Robot out to, like, Hasbro or Mattel or any of that shit. If I'd just been – and I was careful, you know. When I let it go, I was like, you know, please keep their vision, you know. And sometimes they did and sometimes they I, didn't. I, so I'm not going to comment too much about what's happened since I left. But some of that shit sucks, you know, and, yeah. it, and it bums me out. And some of it's still amazing. And that's wonderful. It's just – it, it's a different vision and it's, and it's gotten a lot better since Frank's been around. And I just think like you can't, and I, I should put out, just put this word here. Like is I love Frank Kozik. I love, he's like a wonderful grouchy, fantastic, big hearted, <laughs> like bear of a person. And his art is, has been one of my great inspirations. And so I'm glad he's there now working with it. But I, I, you know, to me, it's just always been, 
heartbreaking when you leave something that you've been so focused on making every aspect of it your way and perfect and it changes. And then some of the stuff hasn't always been great there lately. And that, I mean, the last, since I left and that bums me out. I mean, yeah, you don't want to talk about it, but I can say that f- you can say what you want. Yeah. For me, kind of, I just it's... sit here and nod quietly and politely. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to say anything that I don't think anyone else hasn't noticed. I mean, the company right. that you built and the company that kid robot is today, they, 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 they are two very different companies. What you would built in your vision was, uh, making cool stuff, making rare stuff, art that's very limited edition, uh, very small runs, and then, you know, and you didn't really want to do much licensing at all, except for maybe a few things, like you're excited about The Simpsons and stuff like that, but, you know, today's Kid Robot is, it's very commercialized, it's based around pre-sales, heavily based on um, licensing and they're even licensing out the dunny and stuff like that so you know some people would say today's kid robot might be a healthier approach to things but it's not anywhere to what i think you were building in your vision i just think that the vision you know it's that's the thing man it's like when something loses its vision it just starts to go and and so here's the thing i'm going to say about that like and this is like the hard word about life, which is that like, I studied Zen Buddhism for a very, very, very long time. Mm-hmm. It was another side part of me that was public. Everyone knew that about me. And the thing is, it's like, everything changes. Everything falls apart and dies. Everything does. And at some time, at some point, and letting, the secret is everyone's like, oh, you're being so Zen, you're just letting go and you're cool with it. But the secret actually of Zen is not letting go and being cool with it. It's that everything changes and it always fucking sucks. That's the real thing. It <laughs> okay, always gotcha. hurts. And yeah. yeah, at some point you, you let go and things don't go the way you want them to. And this is one of those cases. And, and at the same time, you know, I always have hope that you know, it'll turn the corner. It's been sold a couple times since I left. So who knows? And yeah. interestingly, a, a couple months ago, a really nice guy flew in from China and another set of investors approached me about making another toy company. Um, Let's do and, it. <laughs> yeah, right. I think it'd be fun. <laughs> I'm thinking about it. And so I've been thinking about it. And I've been kind of looking at the world and thinking about it. And the thing is that, like, I don't quite yet, the time isn't quite there yet if I was going to do that again. Mm-hmm. And mainly because I'm not someone who looks so backwards. And so when I look at it, I would have to say to myself, um, you know, it has to be something that's magical and amazing and somewhat different. And I have to see and feel what that is yeah. before I would be. And, and, and that just happens to be my personality. There are other people who might go, ah, oh, I can make an amazing kid robot from here. And I'm sure you could, but I would be lame at it. And I'm just not interested in doing lame stuff. So, right. No, I would. I love to see you take another crack at it, but you know, um, you know, you've got to do it when the the time is right. Yeah, exactly. Um, Maybe next stuff. I think a lot of the next great stuff is going to come out of Europe. I just have a feeling. A lot of a lot already has, but yeah, a lot. Of, yeah, no- so much great stuff is coming out of Europe and Asia right now. And um, so yeah, let's, let's go back to. Okay, so back to Kid Robot. So yeah. we were talking when when we were talking with. Um, Jim Crawford of Strange Co. He was yeah. telling a story of, you know, you often get approached by artists, you know, that, hey, look at my toy, let's make this together, and you're getting emails and stuff like that. And he was saying that one person that initially contacted him on, that he almost just completely, they just got so busy that he just, you know, had a hard time emailing back and making things work. And so one artist he almost let slip between his fingers was Toki Doki. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. So do you Those have awesome Toki Doki stories. Amazing stuff. And uh, yeah. you know, Toki Doki's huge now and yeah, uh, yeah. was popular back then too, but now it's yeah. you know clothing brand and stores and you know all yeah. that good stuff. Did, was there you have any stories like that of someone that at the time just didn't work out and then blew up or anything like you know any Not that. No. No, not that one and I will tell you No. Because I think we made so many toys that there wasn't <laughs> there was enough capacity for I mean maybe there wasn't enough capacity there was a long line of stuff always but no that I don't think there's anyone we let pass 
that I regret, although I'll probably it might be just be a factor of me being me. There are probably all these famous artists that are like, Kid Robot, diss me. I'm like, God, I just didn't even know you were famous, and I don't remember dissing you. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> you know? Well, uh, but, well you get, right there, you're getting, you're getting ego me. at that point, and I heard you yeah. don't like to work with ego. so Yeah, that is true. Yeah, yeah. I'm, part of my thing was if you're an asshole, we're not going to work with you. So. Yeah. Um, at least there, not again. Was there any projects that I've heard that you were kind of famous for taking a project almost to the end and then deciding that you didn't like it and you would just kill it? Was there anything yeah. that you killed that you wish um, maybe you, you hadn't? Well, I'd say the only things that we had to kill, and I, Huck Gee was a victim of this a few times, uh, and Dalek too. Mm. Dalek, poor Dalek. Dalek made the greatest toys, and every project he had with us was cursed, meaning – the, the toys came out eventually, but they would take years because the molds would break and then there would be a design flaw. Um, but um, yeah. Huck Gee, man. So the reason why Huck makes his own toys partially is because his toys are too expensive to make production-wise because they're too awesome. Because they have all this – I mean, that, the Huck, stuff, Huck has all these ma- ma- amazing, major, beautiful details, little briefcases and little hand grenades and – the, yeah. And so a, and it's just, it's just like he would design a toy and we'd be like start working on it. we'd be like Huck I have to charge seven thousand dollars for this or something like yeah, uh-huh. I, we can't make it and, and we'd have to start over again and it would be like that was a headache but no we would definitely go down the path with a lot of stuff and it would be like you know it just doesn't feel right and if it didn't feel right we just we just would very politely not make it I mean we would be always transparent with everybody you know we're like you know we're gonna keep working on this we'll tell you when it's a go. A little bit like a movie, I guess, you know. Yeah. So a lot of time when we're in a design phase with an artist, we're like, well, let's experiment and see if there's something that comes out that we feel like we want to make. And if it's and if it's not for us, you know, hopefully you can make it yourself or maybe three zero make it or you know, you can work with Toy Two R or somebody else and, and that did or or, you know, when that would work out occasionally. So Now a lot of people will a lot of stores and people would credit like you know, designer toy scene became what it did because of Kid Robot. And a lot of them were very reliant on Kid Robot sales. And, yeah. you know, 2009, you know, stores just started to have, you know, a lot of stores did close and there's some um, still very much going strong and still around. Did you ever feel the pressure of not just on your own company, but all these other, you know, mom and pop shops feeling that your product was sort of responsible for keeping them open as well? Um. Uh, you know, I mean, sort of like Rotofugi and all those wonderful places. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I never felt responsible. I don't know. I not, resp- not, not, yeah, not responsible, okay. but did you feel the pressure of knowing that your, your product was one of the few niche kind of products that they carried? Um, um, uh, yeah, well, I mean, obviously I, I, it was really fun to go in a store and see your stuff, you yeah. know? And especially when you're like some weird country like Chile, <laughs> you know, you're <laughs> yeah. like, oh, my God, that's a bunch of our stuff. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I just think it was, you know, I don't know. It's capitalism and for it's all the good and the bad of it, you know, in the end. Um, that's why I like retail so much, really. I am I, generally less fond of wholesale. And so when we'd sell the stores, we made a really big uh, effort to sell to small stores and we actually kept ourselves out of Toys R Us. We never we were in we Urban Outfitters was our sort of yeah. Urban Outfitters was and then I think we did some stuff for Hot Topic and that was like our okay, we'll go that far, you know? Yeah. But we're not gonna go into Toys R Us, we're not gonna go into these giant toy stores, we're not gonna go into Best Buy, we're not gonna go it was just sort of like you know, probably okay. could have made more money. Yeah, but at the same go. time, that was the beauty of it, that you still stayed small with the boutique stores and the mom and pops. Like, people had to go to Rota Fuji or My Plastic Heart to, to get a lot of the Kid Robot product. You couldn't oh, just go. Oh, especially the limited edition stuff. Yeah, definitely. Limited, we had a little list of friends who owned stores, and they got the limited edition stuff along with Kid Robot. So that even the most rare stuff, we would just hold some back and give them to our friends, and that did help them. But, you know, it's part of the whole thing. That That's, that's what community is. You know, we support each other. Yeah. So they'd help okay. us. They'd buy stuff and we'd say, this is kind of a risky toy, drunk frog and bear suit. They're like, okay, we'll try it. You know? <laughs> I know. Some of this stuff is so outrageous to even look at. Like we mentioned the, the poop. I, who would ever yeah. think that a vinyl piece of poop would have been something that would have been sought after and popular? It's just. Yeah, but Sebastian, Super Dude's a genius. He is. But it's but... special. It's special <laughs> poop. It's French poop for a start. There you go. 
Yeah. That's it's the entire toy scene. There, there's just something for everybody, whether yeah. you like it or not. Like you said, like there's just so many pieces based on irony, like the the yeah. BFF series. You know, you would never think of. Um, yeah, totally. A, a popsicle, you know, rotting love out a those. tooth. It's just such a great mesh, and it's just that's one thing that I love about designer toys. And I, I, I do believe that what you created in Kid Robot is why the scene is still around today. And so I thank you very much for all your hard work and efforts. And um, you know, I, I hope one day you'll return to designer toys. And do you pay attention to the designer toy scene at all anymore? No. Okay. I'm too heartbroken. <laughs> <laughs> I had to move on and so the answer is no uh, recently I uh, no the answer is like a very big no meaning I'm fairly clueless and then occasionally I run into someone something and I'm just like oh my god and then my heart breaks again and I have to kind of move on so yeah. no I get it. and um, yeah well that's nice that you get it that's really cool you know it's like um, as I said I, I'm not I'm not a I'm not a normal person and so I, I can't apologize for who I am and for all the choices we made but I the very nature I think of who I am is that it it's just hard because I think if I spent too much time in it, I'd feel your heart broken and then I'd really want to get into it and then the whole thing would start again and I think that right now I'm still like I said I'm holding off for a little while and at some point maybe maybe we'll dive in again I don't know no. we'll see yeah no I totally understand and I appreciate everything that you uh, you've yeah. done for the industry um, yeah thank you Okay, so Paul, we we try to end the show with just a quick burst of lightning round questions. Are you up uh -huh. for some more? Sure, go for okay. it. So, what was the toy that you created that you were most proud of? Uh, um, can't say. Oh, oh, the dunny toy that was the dun the wood dunnies that were um, CNC cut and that had holes um, drilled. Yeah, and the uh, on the head. The, the Travis Kane dunnies. Yeah, those were. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Fantastic guy, good. Um, good biggest accomplishment and greatest failure while at Kim Roma? Well, I named the greatest failure was moving the store. Mm -hmm. uh, the greatest accomplishment was simply keeping the lights on. Okay. If you could travel back in time, what advice would you give yourself today? Or give yourself then? Uh, um, um, don't move an urban vinyl toy brand to Colorado. <laughs> okay. Not, probably not the right vibe. Okay. What was your favorite childhood toy? Oh, that's easy. Um, uh, we, my friend Troy and I used to go to Chinatown and buy Japanese, big Japanese vinyl toys. So we had like Radine and all those like really early, like pre Power Rangers stuff that no one had that we would watch on late night television. So we had all these Japanese, like early Japanese vinyl toys. And that's a lot of what really fed into the kid robot thing is I had this giant history of owning and playing with that stuff as a little kid. Oh, that's great. Okay. Is there a toy that you wish you had made that maybe someone else did? Yeah. Um, about 90% of the stuff strange Co. <laughs> did yeah. like basically Jim and Greg I mean, my hat has always been off to them. I think they made the most beautiful stuff. And they really stuck to just quality and just some of the production stuff they made was just beautiful, you um, know. And some of the stuff they made that actually never came out um, that I saw was so beautiful, too. They, I mean, the stuff being made today is still beautiful, but I look back at the golden age of um, early Kid Robot, Strange Co., Critter Box was doing amazing stuff with, with the yeah. box designs and everything. So Yeah, yeah and the three, early 3-0 three toys, the 12-inch figures. Oh, yeah. my God. So, so great. And the – yeah, and all, a lot of the – and then, of course, all everything Michael Lau has ever made, essentially, is always something I love. All right, Paul. Well, I thank you so much for taking the time and um, giving us a brief history on Kid Robot and um, – do you want to talk about any of your current ventures? Like you got Ello, and um, that's a creative, like a creative community. That's, yeah, uh... Ello is a ad-free creative community. It's for creators, um, and then Woo, um, which is a um, a messaging app um, that's made to be completely useless for self-promotion. So it's <laughs> it's designed just for sending love between you and the people you care about. And I built it for myself and my friends. Um, we used it for about a year, and then. Finally, I just put it in the App Store a little while ago, and people are downloading it and really liking it, and that makes me happy. So, That's good. Um, yeah, people should go go to woo.co, woo.co, or just go to the Apple App Store and download Woo, and Android's coming soon. That's spelled W-U-U. -U. Oh, yeah, yeah, W-U-U, -U, Woo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's um, 
it's just rad. It's pretty radical. And it's cool. pretty pretty great. You know, it's filled with love. So like, like I said, you're a creative genius. Some of these things that you're coming up with, Ello, I mean, <laughs> your little um, kind of F you to Facebook a little bit and the fact that you're – Like all the artists and all the creative people in the world saying, like, go to hell. We're going to put our stuff up over here. It was so, fantastic yeah. The what you put in place with um, legal documents saying that you're not going to have – advertising and all the stuff that people hate about Facebook, you're not doing over on Ello. And uh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So basic, the basic theory is that, um, in fact, I, I'll, get, I'll, get, I'll tell you a little closing anecdote about business in general for people who are kind of interested in, in starting and doing their own thing. Okay. You know, a lot of the time when you're doing something really original, you have a hard time explaining what you're doing to people because it, if you were doing, if you were, if you, if you, if it wasn't original, they would already, someone would have already been doing it and it would be easy to get. And the fact that it is new makes it hard to explain. And when we released Woo in the app store, like three weeks ago, I got a call from someone from one of the big tech journals. And his first question was, how are you ever going to become as big as Facebook? And I said to him, I told you before we went on this call that I would not answer that question. And I got off the call and just, you know, because the fact of the matter is I'm not building things to be as big as Facebook. If I wanted to build another Hasbro, I probably could have done it, but it wouldn't have been any fun and it wouldn't have been beautiful and it would not have enriched the world. And it's my belief that the, a lot of the really beautiful stuff that essentially changes the world isn't always the biggest thing and we are so habituated to the idea that we have to make gigantic, I mean, gigantic, enormous companies. I mean, Kid Robot at its largest size, you know, was something like, you know, a 50th the size of Hasbro or Mattel, mm -hmm. you know. So and that's when it was really, you know, before the economic crisis and we were just really just booming. And and a lot of that and a lot of that growth, some of that growth was was almost reluctant, meaning we were we would produce smaller runs and then they would just sell out too fast. And it was trying to keep that balance. And I, I guess what I'd say is that bigger isn't always better. Right. And if you look toward the bicycle company and the stuff I'm doing, I'm about making stuff I believe in and I love essentially usually first for me. And I encourage people to follow that path whenever their hearts are in it and not succumb to the idea that you have to make something giant. Because like Wu is not here let's say, to be the next Snapchat. It's actually here to be a small boutique for people who love it and for the people that are using it. And um, same thing was true with Allo and Kid Robot and the bike company. And it sounds like maybe your blog. I mean, maybe it'd be great if this, I guess your podcast was being listened to by 3 billion people, but we can have a much more frank conversation because you are not Fox News. You know? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I've been interviewed by Fox News and it's a, it's a pain in the ass. I That's great advice and I... I... I agree with your philosophy. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah, so, so I encourage you, Gary, keep it up because this is it's great. You're 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 a great presenter, by the way, and this is your questions have been excellent, which is oh, an hour and a half of excellent questions. That's it's it's thing. funny because when I started this, I was the shy guy who is a man of very little words in person, oh. and so the fact that I can do this behind a microphone is strange to me, probably strange to my wife and everybody else, but uh, somehow oh. I I make it happen every week, and it's I appreciate great. that. So keep it up. Well, yeah. Um, so thanks very much, Paul. I, I wish you the best of luck in all your future ventures, and maybe one day we'll we'll cross paths. I'd love that. I okay. really would. All right. This has been the Marsham Toy Hour. We do this every week, not because we have to, but because we want to. So until our next transmission, we're signing off. Bye. Okay. Bye.